here. Sharing. And then we go to right. Well, good good morning, everybody. Hi, can you swap um, your uh... yeah? Ah, thank yes. you for the help. There we swap. I now know the perfect, button. perfect. Thank you, Jess. Good morning, everybody. Um, we have um, a nice session for you in um, in, uh, in progress and started, which is about OS open science policies. It means that we will have uh, 90 minutes where you can uh, voice your comments on the proposals that we what we bring, and you can help us bring these policies forward and point out um, interesting things that should be should be said or should be moved into the, the deciding processes of the EOS association or the st steering board. Um, my name is um, Jos van Bezel. I will um, moderate this session, which is um, a combination of, 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 of Mentimeter polls and presentations. Um, I'll just um, give the floor for, for everybody going to to present in these in this in this meeting, um, so I'll ask I'll ask everybody to who is presenting in this meeting to switch on their cameras, and I will have to stop sharing. I, I suppose. Okay. So in um, we have uh, uh, Joy Davidson. Um, we have Michal Ruiska, um, we have Elektra Sifakaki, um, Katarina Skanga, and Brian Matthews in this sequence. And if um, you can find these names there. Um, okay, so that's it. And um, I'll move on to the presentation now. So one of the things um, where this is coming from is uh, that I want to explain briefly. This, this session is organized by um, five projects. You can see them, six projects. You can see them on the bottom of the screen here. Um, and there is some involvement of the project EOS Secretariat as well. These six projects, they have worked together in a task force. And the task force were set up in the beginning after these projects were, start, were starting to function in 2019. And it was the explicit request by the commission and it was an explicit wish of also of these projects to work together in several areas. Um, Jeff, these um, can I yeah. just um, interrupt? You? We can't see your screen at the moment. I think you need to share again. Ah, sorry, that's good news. Uh, share screen, thank you. There we go. Oh, it's all fine again, right? Yeah, that's great. Yes. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Um, and this, this, these tasks, the, there were several task forces formed. One of the, uh, so there were task forces, they were all aligned with, at that time, the working groups. One task force that was a little bit of uh, an ex explicit, um, a wide, al the albino task force, and this was the, uh, the task force on policies and governance. This means that also that meant that also these projects were working together in this in this area that they do not did not all have um, effort in. However, and there, if they did have effort, it was um, the projects were contributing in different shapes and different scopes and different approaches. So it was um, what you can see also in this meeting that there are different areas that we um, that we covered on the policy on the policy aspects. And this is why um, you will see that the, that there are not only different aspects, but also different approaches in how we um, worked on, on the policy, on the open science policies in these, in these projects. Um, the results of, of this session and the results of the work that we did in these, in these, in these, in these task force and in the projects will um, 
of course, go to policymakers by the way of our deliverables. But um, what I'd like to stress here is that since these things have are still in progress, you have a chance here of influencing this, this or steering this, especially with um, your voting later in the Mentimeter polls. Um, and it will also go directly to the EOSC Association because they're very keen on, on knowing um, what has to be done in the, in, to bring these policies forward in, in, in with regard to open science. And um, so this is also a reason why we keep looking into the presentations and in the, in the results towards the so-called um, strategic uh, research agenda, the SRIA. We have um, actions formulated that you can think of and work on and think uh, with, uh, with us together here in this, in this, in this meeting um, on the following actions, on, on, on the following topics. Um, the topic of data management planning, the topic of uh, persistent identifiers, um, on legal aspects of policies for data protection and for intellectual property rights on research products. So these are the groups that will be presented later. Um, each group will be con concluded with a, uh, with a poll. Um, I explicitly repeat this again, ask you to interact and to discuss things uh, on the, not only on the proposed actions, but also on the presentations, of course, um, with raised hands and later the Mentimeter poll. Um, we have to, um, this is just for the logistics, uh, make sure that, uh, that these things work in a way that we expect because there is multiple presentations, multiple screen sharing and multiple hands raised. And sometimes Zoom does not allow you to see all the screens at the same time. So be patient if you're not here or just maybe try to get, I've, I've seen before I switched off uh, to the presentation um, that there are 30 people in the, in the audience. So that's possible that you can just um, make your voice here then with uh, going, um, forego on the on raising the hand. Um, and at last but not least, there is a possibility to bring your own priority action uh, into the session by another poll. The agenda is as follows. <clears throat> um, we will start with a uh, overview of experiments that are mainly working transnational by Brian Matthews. Um, a session on data management planning, and then a session on the PIDs, concluded with a Mentimeter poll. And then there will be a session on legal aspects, an introduction to intellectual property rights, and also concluded with a poll. And then we'll have a, a few minutes to discuss all these things. And this is where we have to get inventive and uh, see how, how um, and you can go back and, and interact with, uh, with the presenters. Um, the sequence is like this, that uh, Brian will give an overview and setting the scene for all these policy uh, measures that we uh, have discussed in these projects. Um, because especially in these transnational projects, it's, um, it's coming all together that you have to deal with different implementations all over the different countries. I'm concluding here, and I will ask Brian to start his presentation. I will show the, the slides, Brian, so you just have to tell every now and then that I need to move to the next slide, but I'm giving you the audio channel now. Many thanks, Josh. Uh, thank you for that introduction. Um, yes, so I'm, uh, I'm Brian Matthews. Um, I uh, lead a uh, a work package in the expand project which is called enabling fair data um and i'll explain a little bit about that later uh so what i'm going to do is give some motivation about why we are looking at the harmonization of policies uh, and as part of that you know providing fairer policies um so from the example of our our, our work on transnational experiments so next slide please Right. Thank you. Uh, yeah. So, uh, as Josh mentioned, we're we're you know we are working in the the European Open Science Cloud um, arena, and 
particularly driven by the strategic research and innovation agenda. So the ultimate sort of aim of, of what we're doing, if you like, is driven by this, this sort of objective um, that we are trying to you know, build those standards, tools and services that really will allow our research community to find access reusing the results. The ultimate word, what we're trying to do, improve the science of what, what, what comes out. And, um, you know, but, and through that, we want to be able to uh, in, um, enhance those data management practices and, and the publication of, of fair data um, in, the, in the EOS ecosystem to, to allow that. So that gives us a real sort of incentive for doing this. And, um, uh, but, you know, there are a lot of barriers on the way to doing that. Can we have the, the next slide? So as I, I mentioned, I'm, I'm from an expand. So, um, Expands is, we always say, a little bit different from the, some of the other projects under this by Be Cool, because uh, Expands is a thematic project. So in, in, instead of um, uh, representing, sorry, um, next, go back a bit the slide. We've gone forward a slide. We've gone other direction. We go back to the... Thank you. Um, so... Um, a little different. Instead of representing a, 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 a collection of a regional collection of countries in, in Europe, um, we expect we're thematic, and we expect a, we represent a number of different institutions working in the same area uh, around around Europe. Um, and what particularly we we are um, uh, large scale national facilities, uh, analytic facilities, working in materials, working in chemistry, and, and those sorts of related areas. Um, so large institutions, you know, as, as national institutes, and the research we do um, uh, supports the researchers, that in, in, you know, particularly in our, from universities, research from organisations in our countries. Uh, they come and visit our facilities, um, provide, do experiments, uh, generate data, uh, and take, you know, and, and then use that for analysis, uh, analysis in their results. So they're typically funded by organisations that aren't us. So when we're setting up an experiment, when we're doing data management planning for an experiment, we are influenced by a lot of different factors. Firstly, the, 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 the context of our, of our experiment, the instruments being used and, and, and what the, and the data management priorities of, of the user themselves. And then those things themselves are influenced by the policies uh, of both the facility itself, but also the, the national funder who's funding that user and the university they're from, and ultimately the whole pol policy and legal framework of, of, of the country. This gets, so we've got a quite a complicated situation where a lot of, a number of different policies come together uh, to influence the way that we do our data management planning. This gets even more complicated because we are increasingly allowing transnational access funders so researchers come from other countries um, funded, and funded by, by from within those other countries and they typically may well um, want to work in multiple institutions and combine the results from different experiments in different institutions so you can say we've got this uh, diagram on the right but actually replicated several times over uh, so the, the, the policy landscape the landscape becomes even more complicated so when we want to do um, the, you know when we do want to provide that fair access to research outputs from across other countries, combine outputs from other facilities. You know, there's, there's quite a complex uh, scenario that we may potentially have to deal with. Uh, so we want to simplify that as much as possible. So can we have the, ne the next slide? Um, yeah, and those, so, you know, the, the way to simplify it us, if we want to do that fair data exchange between experimental data from different facilities, um, we need to want to be able to harmonize our, our data policies from our different institutes. Um, and that is kind of what we're looking at in, in the Expands project. We, we've recently done a lot of work on providing a framework for a common, common framework for doing data policy across different institutes. And that would even work even better if um, the, the national data policies that provide by the funders and the legal frameworks were also uh, uh, um, harmonized because the, 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 the local national data policy takes precedence over the, the um, facilities. So, there's, so from our point of view, there's immense value in harmonizing policies at, at, at facility level and at national level uh, to really ease this, this transnational access um, 
Um, uh, so next slide, please. Um, however, you know, there are barriers to that, uh, and these are, these are some of them which reflect the, 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 the talks coming later in the day. So the legal frameworks, the, the legal um, environment in which we sit, looking at things like data protection, um, and also the way that uh, data licenses and copyright law are applied. So the legal framework in which we sit, um, IPR issues, um, uh, who owns the data? We found differences in different countries between the attitude about who owns data, or, uh, um, uh, you know, it, how, you know, is is it all the right? The, is the data all the ownership of the end user scientist who's doing the experiment, or or does the facility itself that's paid to generate the, you know, the the using its resources to generate that data is that you know is that is that got rights over that data as well? So we need to make the, the um, distinction there. Um, they have different rules on, on accessing data. There are different, there, there are various restrictions that apply to data, not just from GDPR, but also from, from other reasons, uh, particularly embargoes, um, you know, providing a limited period of time for that user to have access to it. Um, and they also um, support access by, by, by using persistent identifiers. Uh, so different um, approaches to providing different persistent identifiers, which may be in the pattern, you know, we need to make sure they're compatible. And then a uh, different data management approaches. What is their depth of commitment to FAIR? What, what results do they publish? What information do they provide? Um, uh, you know, what is the metadata framework they're working in? Um, uh, you, know, you know, those different, you know, we want to, if we can to get the maximize the riches and maximize the interoperability in the data we do really want to make a common data management approach. So moving on to my final slide. So we want to remove some of these um, barriers to harmonization. So what you know our proposed actions and you know, what we're doing, you know, we we're, we're raising awareness, you know, we've been doing um, a lot of advocacy in our, in our project around our, our different institutes to raise awareness of the issues around data policy with both uh, users, uh, scientists, and, and, and senior managers. And we've been proposing a common approach to, to do these experimental facilities. And as I said, what we'd really like to do is, is have this work within a harmonized approach at national, European, regional, and cross European levels. So, so make all our lives a lot easier by, by being able to interpret those different policies in a, in a common framework, a common way. Okay, so I hope that sets a little bit of scene from, from our project uh, to, to motivate the rest of the day. Uh, and I will pass back to Josh uh, to introduce the next talk. Thank you, thank you, Brian. Yes, we will now go to the next talk, which is on, on DMPs introduced by, uh, by Joy Davidson. Um, but let me use this second to also stress the fact that the presentations are a combination of output of the different projects. So the coming presentations are um, a joint effort of all these projects, um, and um, because it's it's it, you will not see um, the um, the project in top of it, um, but um, the com combined output of these projects. But um, Going on to the next um, presentation, which is by Joy. I'll have to move again. Yes. Okay, Joy, I give you your chance to. Thanks. Start. I think we could probably go straight into the next slide. So, yeah, my name is Joy Davidson. I'm uh, with the Digital Curation Center in the UK, and I lead Work Package 3 in the Fairs Fair project, which is looking at policy and practice. So, I've been kind of trying to gather together some information on the data management plans. And I think it's, it's good to remember that we see data management plans as a tool for researchers to consider at the outset of their projects, what sort of data they'll collect, what they'll generate and what they might end up reusing in their research activities. And um, the data management plans really do help them to really think through the issues around what can be shared, um, how they'll share it, at what point in the research life cycle and with whom. So we see data management plans really as being an essential tool for enabling the production and reuse of FAIR data. So within uh, the EOSC ecosystem, uh, data management plans do play a really cr critical role. Um, as we've referred to uh, already a couple of times this morning, um, we have been using the Strategic Research and Innovation Agenda, the SRIA document, 
to try and frame some of the policy recommendations. Um, so I've included here uh, some of the objectives and KPIs related to data management planning. Um, so essentially within the three objective, they, they do want to see um, the production of, of good research facilitated through data management planning. And one of the KPIs that they have uh, given themselves within the first few years of, of the EOSC uh, operation is they want to see an increase in the number of members, EOSC Association members, who are having policies that require fair data be implemented through uh, data management planning. And the key target that they have given themselves is that they want 70% of EOSC Association members to have such policies in place by 2023. So really within a, a relatively short time frame, um, we should start to see data management planning being a, a core aspect of, of policies for ES association members. So if we can move on to the next slide, please. Great. So data management planning have been a key topic that have been explored in most of the infra EOS 5B projects. Um, it's certainly, it has been core to many of the um, uh, landscaping activities that we've been looking at, just trying to get a sense of what policies are in place and where there might be gaps. And I've got a selection of, of recommendations here that I'm gonna run through that have come through the various projects. And I think it's, it's probably crucial to say here, these are not all of the recommendations, it's just a selection, some of the, the key ones that we have in relation to data management planning. Uh, so for the first recommendation, and these are a couple that came through my project, which is Fair is Fair, and um, we will share the slides at the end, and we have some links that you can follow if you'd like to read the full set of recommendations for uh, the ones I'm going to present. Uh, but the first thing that we are recommending uh, in Fair is Fair is that we want to move towards policies requiring the updating of data management plans over the life cycle. Um, we see that as being fairly uh, critical to, to the production and, and reusability of FAIR data. So we want to see that people are coming back to their DMPs and uh, updating them to reflect things that are happening in the project. What we'd also like to see is that this updating actually leads towards the development of uh, an end stage DMP. And the key difference in an end stage DMP versus something that you're working on during the life of the project is that an end stage DMP actually reflects what was done rather than what is planned. So it's more of an accurate record of, of what happened in the project and, that, and how the data was handled. And it does lead to better reusability potential, we think. Uh, the other thing that we recommend from Fair is Fair is that there needs to be more consistency across policymakers in the timing of uh, when DMPs are required. Uh, we notice that there's a lot of disparity. Some want them at the pre-award stage when you're writing the grants application. Others like the Euro European Commission are looking to have a DMP delivered as a deliverable within the first six months. Um, I think we, uh, if we're moving towards this notion of updating the DMPs, we would expect to see maybe something at the grant application stage, something that comes through uh, the various points in the life cycle. But we'd like to see greater consistency across the policymakers on this. Uh, when we move on to uh, EOS Synergy, there was some requirements coming out of their proposal, uh, their project. And I think their key is, again, to say that they believe that the requirements of, of DMPs should be standard within the policies of institutions and funding bodies. Um, in their particular set of requirements, they also stress the need for um, uh, adhering to the, the advice from Science Europe, where we're looking to try and reflect domain and, and disciplinary norms and protocols. So uh, there's an emphasis there on not just requiring DMPs as, as standard, but really trying to require DMPs that reflect the environment that you're working in and the community that you're part of. Um, crucial to that recommendation is that we need to have the existence of national services and infrastructures that can support this in, in, in a practical sense. Uh, so I think those were the key ones coming out of uh, EOS Synergy. And again, you can see uh, there's a link to a report that you can read. The last two came from the NIFOS project. 
Um, and again, NIFAS are very clear that they believe that the drafting of DMPs has to be just taken for granted. This should be the default for all policies. Um, we, we have to start moving towards the creation of DMPs as standard. Um, but they're also very clear in their rules that um, one of the things that we have seen in the landscape is that there's now a proliferation of different tools and, and templates and approaches to writing DMPs. And uh, in their set of recommendations, they were very clear that they want it to be left up to the researcher and their organization to decide which of these tools they use, if any. Um, they may choose to use something that they've created at their uh, own institutions. So there needs to be that flexibility um, to choose which of these tools you want to use, if any, and, and not have that imposed on, on the researcher and the organization. And, and the, last, uh, the rec last recommendation from NIFOS um, was that really regardless of how you develop your DMP, whether you're using an online shared service or something that has been developed locally, um, the key emphasis we should be moving to in our policies is to require machine actionable DMPs. And I think this is really going to be crucial if we're ever looking to um, move towards an environment where the information held within DMPs can be used. So uh, fed into machine actionable pipelines. So this notion of machine actionability is, is quite crucial. So if we can just move on to the last slide, I'll, I'll give you a quick summary of the policy actions. And these will be the ones that we'll be asking you to consider in the Menti poll. So I'll give you a chance to think about that while we uh, run through them and then we'll move on to the next talk. So the key actions that we're proposing need to be uh, prioritized as we move forward. So what do we want to uh, really feed back to the EOSC Association as being a priority area? Um, do we still need to focus a lot of work on trying to make sure that there is um, uh, the requirement for DMPs across all of those uh, policymakers who perhaps haven't included it within their policies yet? Should that be our priority? Um, should we instead maybe focus on those who do have requirements already in their policies and really try to harmonize um, this notion of having the updating of the DMPs leading to the uh, end stage uh, DMP requirements? Should we be focusing more on trying to get those um, community specific and discipline specific um, requirements into the DMPs and making sure that uh, funders recognize this uh, particularly in their policies? And should we be pushing more to try and, and get that existence of the national services and the infrastructures to provide support to be able to make sure that we get these sorts of DMPs being produced? And the last one is, you know, maybe we, we decide to focus more on that kind of ambitious target of making all of the DMPs machine actionable and, and having that as a, a key priority action for policies. So I'm going to stop there. You can think about those and we'll come back to them in the mentee in a few minutes and you can have your say. Uh, but for the next few minutes, you'll hear a little bit about the recommendations coming out of the projects around persistent identifiers. So I'll hand over to you, Michelle. Thank you. Thank you very much. My name is Michal Ruchka. I am from Masaryk University in the Czech Republic, and I am uh, participating uh, on the EOS Synergy project. And I will discuss uh, persistent identifiers from the point of view of uh, EOS Synergy and uh, other projects. Next slide, please. Uh, if you see what's uh, written in uh, EOS Syria, uh, you can uh, see uh, one objective uh, that uh, can be uh, applied on uh, persistent identifiers. And uh, uh, more or less, uh, this uh, objective says uh, that uh, we should follow fair principles. And important part of, uh, of uh, fair principles is uh, fendability, interoperability, and uh, other things. And persistent identifiers are a very important uh, part uh, that allows you to uh, be compatible with uh, FAIR principles. Uh, this uh, particular uh, uh, requirement uh, want uh, to have at least 50% uh, uh, by, uh, by uh, two, uh, 2027. Next slide, please. Uh, uh, when we were uh, investigating uh, uh, work with uh, PADs uh, in uh, uh, EOSC Synergy. Uh, we uh, we uh, 
find uh, several several things, and uh, one of them is uh, that uh, PID should be uh, should be recommended by EOSC or uh, uh, some recommendation should be uh, given for uh, PIDs for uh, multiple or different uh, types of objects uh, that uh, should be identified by persistent identifiers. Uh, in fact, uh, there are multiple systems uh, or types of uh, persistent identifiers usable uh, even for, for one, uh, one type. For example, for data sets, you can use DOI or you can use Handlem. And uh, uh, we should support uh, multiple PIDs per object for historical reason. On the other hand, we should probably agree at least for EOS on one recommended best standard in sense best standard uh, for uh, every type of uh, object uh, PIDs should be assigned to and uh, use uh, this particular standard for this. Uh, to reach this goal, uh, it is important uh, some uh, standardization and uh, we believe in our project that uh, uh, national policies or on PIDs should be uh, should be uh, created and adopted, and uh, these uh, should be uh, uh, that uh, should be done not only for common data type like publications or data set, but also for physical persons, institutions, project numbers, grant numbers, software, software containers, uh, even uh, uh, software workflows or pipelines, etc. So. Uh, there are some entities uh, that should be assigned PIDs, but uh, are not uh, uh, are not uh, as of now. And uh, it is uh, the uh, the last uh, of the of the most important findings uh, that we should raise awareness of uh, importance of PIDs uh, for all types including the uncommon artifacts uh, like uh, software containers or, or workflows. Next slide, please. Uh, uh, in fact, other projects uh, consider uh, more or less uh, the same things or similar, similar things. Uh, for example, in uh, Expand, uh, they, uh, they uh, uh, propose uh, uh, standardization and uh, policies uh, that uh, specify who is responsible for, uh, for example, for storing data, ensuring uh, long-term uh, long uh, access, uh, uh, etc. So uh, giving policies and uh, agreement on uh, policies, uh, how to do things. Uh, uh, similar is uh, for uh, fair, uh, fair is fair. Uh, that uh, says that it's, it is important to assign PIDs uh, to the policies themselves to be easily identifiable and uh, available uh, via uh, PID resolve system. And uh, uh, NIFOS uh, uh, repository service uh, should uh, be integrated with a persistent identifier system that uh, allows you to assign PIDs for, uh, for required objects, again, including some kind of uncommon uh, objects like communities. Next slide, please. So uh, we propose uh, these uh, simple actions. The first one is raising awareness. That's uh, important. Then uh, you have to support standardization as uh, with uh, not uh, compatible systems, so you are unable to, to cooperate that should be agreed on a national level and coordinated between, uh, between uh, governments uh, to follow the same principles. Uh, policies should, uh, should identify the recommended standard suitable for, uh, for uh, every data type or uh, entity type uh, that's uh, needed. And uh, uh, research performing institutions should insist on assigning PIDs uh, their uh, data sets uh, that they are uploading to the repositories or assigning PIDs to other entities uh, they are working in. And uh, what's uh, 
what's a combination of raising awareness and uh, standardization, we simply should insist on use of uh, these uh, PIDs as standard way of uh, identifying and referring objects. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. So I, I've just put a, um, a link in the chat and you can see on the screens, hopefully the, the Menti poll that we would like you to now join and start voting on. So if you can go to menti.com and enter the code 478216, you should be able to start voting on the first two topics that we've presented. Um, the first one, I'll remember you of the, remind you of the, uh, the topics that we would like you to prioritize for us. Um, we want to know whether you think um, the key issue is requiring DMPs as standard. Is that something we should be pushing to the, the commission uh, and to the EOSC Association, focusing our efforts there? Um, requiring the updating of DMPs over the life cycle. Um, should we be prioritizing the end stage DMPs coming through? Um, should it be more important for us to, to work on getting standardization on the domain specific requirements related to DMPs? And related to that, ensuring the national um, services and infrastructure to support that? Or do we want to put our efforts into making the DMPs machine actionable? And it looks at the moment that we're seeing uh, about 10 people have put their, their views in and it's, it's quite close at the moment. So I think we're seeing the, the first and the last seem to be the most pressing for most people. So I think a lot of people are saying that we really need to put our efforts into making sure that we just get DMPs as a default in, in policies. So that's uh, quite an interesting one. Also interesting to see that we're, we're seeing quite a lot of people going to the opposite end of the spectrum and thinking we should be much more ambitious and not just requiring DMPs, but pushing for them to be machine actionable. So that's that's quite interesting. And that is taking a slight lead for the, the time being. So I think we're about halfway through the participants who are uh, joining today. So if, if I'll give you another couple of minutes to have your say. What we'll be doing with the top two priorities, or if we have a tie, the top three, is taking them forward into the discussion at the end of the session. So we won't have too much discussion now, but you will have your chance to maybe make your case as to why you, you feel a certain area is more uh, pressing than others. And indeed, at that point, you can also say if you think there's maybe something missing. So it looks like we have a three-way tie at the moment. So that's, uh, that's quite interesting. Uh, 19 people have voted so far. I'm going to give you another two minutes before we move on to the next poll to see if we can get a few more people voting. I think we'll, we'll hopefully try to get at least 25 people having their say before we move on to the next next slide. So still a three-way tie. Um, I, I think it's interesting to see again that we have, you know, the baseline is, is a strong priority. The ambitious aim for the machine actionability is a key aim, but also good to see that people are saying that we need to push for the availability of support services and infrastructures to get to these sorts of visions. So a slight increase now on the... the so everything seems standards. to be very important, Joy. Well, that's also good to see. I think it's uh, it's certainly nothing seems to be um, getting no votes. So um, I, I think we can also feed that back to the association that um, uh, all of these topics do have a lot of uh, uh, traction. So I think we'll give you one more second if you would like to get your votes in. Oh, I think we're seeing a couple now. And at that, I think we will stop there. So DMPs as standards and guidance seem to be the top two that we will take forward to the next round. So I will stop there and we'll move on to the PID uh, poll. So Michelle, I'll, I'll hand over to you. And we have to switch to the screen, right? Um, the oh, poll. There there we go. Go. So the 
this poll, we are looking for you to share your views on whether you think governments um, should be pressed to agree on a national policy for persistent identifiers. Um, should we put putting our efforts there? Um, should the policy explicitly identify one or a small number of suitable standards for PIDs for particular entities? And that seems to be getting a lot of traction. Should the policy require RPI to assign uh, persistent identifiers for their data sets um, before uploading to repositories? Uh, insist on the use of standard PIDs um, for referencing entities. And the last one here is, is that um, we, we were wondering whether to include it or not, this um, notion of raising awareness. We wondered if, if we had moved beyond the need to do that. But I think what we're seeing here is that no, we haven't. <laughs> I think we still need to, to put a focus on getting the awareness. So we've got about 14 people so far who have had their say on this. So, so there, there's also a comment in the chat and a question, I think, for you. Oh, yeah, please go ahead. And um, I, I can't see them now that I'm sharing my screen. So no, the, que the, question, the question is, um, what is the added value of machine actionable DMPs, Joy? So the, the, the added, added value of machine actionable DMPs is that we can start to feed them into machine actionable pipelines um, so that, you know, there is the potential to actually um, have decisions being made across the life cycle of, of the, the data management plan. So if there are particular things that have to happen, um, places for the, the data to be deposited or identifiers to be assigned, we can start to make sure that these are fed into workflows. Um, it, it sort of assumes that we have machine actionable workflows more generally in the research data management environment. And I, I don't think we're entirely joined up on that, um, but that, that would be the added value if we can move towards that. So I see, Michelle, you've got your hand raised. Yeah, uh, if I can uh, add uh, uh, to the machine actionable DMPs, uh, one uh, thing I uh, consider useful is uh, if you have uh, information uh, on uh, data management in machine actionable way, you can also uh, calculate some metrics uh, that uh, tells you how uh, findable your data are, how how uh, interoperable they are, etc. And again, it's uh, also uh, machine actionable. You can calculate these metrics uh, on large scale for for uh, full uh, content of the repository and uh, see see full uh, see numbers for all content, for example. Yeah, that's that's a great point. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, so hopefully that answered your question, um, but if not, we can also pick this up in the, the final discussion. So I think we've got 20 people who've had their say so far on the PID poll. Uh, so far, the last two options seem to be the, the strongest views. So insisting on the use of standard PIDs and this emphasis on, on raising the awareness uh, on the need for them to be included in policies is, is getting good traction. So I'll give you just another couple of seconds if you want to add and it seems it seems joy that that since all these um all these actions are um everybody's in favor of these actions that the the, the it's in the details there right so the, yeah. the preference <laughs> of something is really on the top so you can say that that uh, the 4.4 for the insisting on the use of standard pids is one of the highest recommended things but it doesn't i mean it's it's very difficult to value the the priority of these things uh, because everything seems to be important. So we should look at um, probably at the highest numbers there, even though they're set, uh, with um, they're they're just a fraction of of the of the total. Yeah, I, I think that's a good point. I think certainly when we feed back to the EOSC Association, I think we can make this clear that um, we we have a. A strong number of, of policy actions that might need to be taken forward, um, in addition to those that we prioritize as being uh, the top. So I think we can stop there and I'll, I'll stop sharing my screen so we can move on to the next set of, of discussions. Um, but thank you very much to those of you who have taken part in the poll so far, and we will come back to the next uh, set of poll questions in about 10 minutes or so. Thank you, Joy. I'll um, switch now to the presentation uh, for Electra and um, Katarina.
Oh, great, great. So hello from me. Uh, I'm Elektra uh, Tsipakaki. Um, I'm a research associate at the Athena Research Center, uh, the Greek Research Center for Data and ICT, which is heavily involved in and uh, supporting open science, and I participate in Nikos Europe project. Well, this part of the presentation will cover the legal aspects of making policies more findable and accessible. Uh, next, please. So hearing the word legal, someone would say that this is something that we should really leave it to the experts. In reality, legal conditions and provisions are present in our everyday open science related activities. In this area, the importance of a legal interoperability and legal framework are underpinned at different places. By definition, EOSC is a digital environment that bridges different research communities, services, and research providers across borders. This makes legal interoperability and social aspects to federate services into the EOSC. As research communities, being at the heart of EOSC, they play an important role in the shaping of open science policy. Uh, next, please. So uh, within our task force, uh, we want to bring forward the position that in order to use and implement the open science policies, including legal and the policies themselves, they have to be fair. All five big projects, to some extent, address legal aspects uh, of open science policies. Uh, some of them propose concrete suggestions or work in this area. So, uh, according to EOSC Nordic, in house legal expertise and support is important to effectively enable data sharing across borders and keep up with the changes to the legal framework. Uh, both EOSC Synergy and Expand underline the importance of national strategies. And in specific, uh, EOSC Synergy recognizes the role of open science principles and RDM recommendations in designing national strategies and policies on open science and fair data. Expand stands on the importance of policy review. Reviewing whether policies still meet the community's needs will ensure that they follow the guidelines and policies. So policies don't get outdated. Finally, MIFOS remarks that, they very often, uh, that very often legal aspects related to fair and ORDM are addressed by non-legal experts. They create the need to, for technical solutions to address legal aspects in fair and ORDM to take the burden off their shoulders. MIFOS has developed two tools that they intended to provide different um, direct support to non-legal experts uh, the, uh, the LCP and the RELECT. And the third one, REPO, that supports the drafting of uh, repository policies. Uh, if you haven't attended our demo yesterday, you can still have the opportunity to do this today the, at the afternoon batch of the demos. So next slide, please. Um, our proposed actions. Well, policies is a rather broad field, so proposing actions can result in almost endless lists. Uh, in our discussions within the task force, we have distilled for the following priorities. So uh, we, we should make uh, open science policies an integral part, part of uh, national research framework and legislation. Uh, several countries have already started to integrate open science. This should be further intens intensified. Uh, compliance through review. Uh, we should frequently review adopted policies uh, to ensure that they cover the needs of the research community. This way, we also increase the respect and the adoption. Uh, In-house expertise is needed, but is it necessary and sufficient condition to address all legal aspects of FAIR and RBM? Do all organizations, especially small ones, have this capacity? technical solutions giving unnecessary attention on legal interoperability can support researchers and administrators dealing with legal aspects of fair and ORDM. So uh, that's all for me. We can now pass to the next uh, uh, speaker. Okay, thank you. I just lost focus on the on the slides here um, because um, there we go. Yeah. 
next this week. one sorry exactly. there you go katarina thank you yes good morning everyone also from me i'm katarina sganga associate professor at scuola superiore santana specialized in intellectual property i work within the framework of the eos pillar uh, project i'm here to uh, briefly um, explain uh, what is our view in terms of uh, policies that need to be implemented on the side of uh, intellectual property law related to research products. Uh, so I will give you exactly as other speakers before uh, um, a brief background on the results of our mapping and research and then uh, I will move to the proposed uh, uh, action. So the basic analysis we uh, conducted uh, uh, across different member states showed that uh, um, intellectual property law is uh, deeply involved in guaranteeing openness uh, and interoperability of research data, as well as it happens for uh, data protection uh, uh, law and non-personal data uh, law. So aside of the privacy uh, matters, uh, so everything that is related to the implementation of the General Data Protection Regulation, the GDPR, and all the um, uh, EU and national regulations in the field of uh, non-personal uh, data protection and free flow of non-personal data, IP law plays a role that is often uh, uh, underestimated in the uh, open science uh, field. And I'm referring particularly to all those aspects related to copyright protection uh, and, uh, um, and the like. Copyright doesn't just cover uh, articles or scientific productions of literary, in literary forms, unquote, but it also refers to uh, the protection of databases. That is fundamental when you talk about AI work, data, metadata and everything that is related to text and data mining. So uh, particularly in the last uh, two decades, copyright went to uh, chip into the management of uh, and uh, interoperability of uh, materials that are not just literary anymore, but are also uh, a bit more up in the stream of, uh, of research production. Next slide, please. So when you look at the um, needs we have to Im implement a fair ecosystem for uh, research data, and when we look also at the uh, needs we have uh, uh, to implement uh, open access and open science policies uh, in, uh, in Europe, intellectual property rights are involved as obstacles most of the time, more than our, as, as enablers. So what we focused on, and this is the product of uh, exactly as for other fields, uh, the shared uh, views of uh, several uh, uh, EOS projects working together on these aspects, uh, so the views we, we basically have are um, can be structured uh, around basically two points. They are very general. Of course, we can provide more details afterwards. But the main focus of uh, of our attention in terms of reforms needed are on the side of exceptions and limitation to copyright, and on the side of uh, copyright contract uh, law. Um, to, to make it less legalese uh, and more down to earth. Exceptions and limitations are those instruments by which the law allows us to use copyright protected works or copyright protected data without asking for the authorization of right holders and without paying for it, or at least in most of the cases without paying for it. This means that by having an exception, we can have legal certainty on the fact that we can freely use for certain purposes works or data that are protected. We don't need to go and knock at the door of uh, uh, the right holder. This means that a researcher doesn't have every time to be scared uh, or to get into chilling effects compared to the use of that material or uh, that set of data. In order to do that, you need to have in the law a specific exception that, is, uh, that, it, that targets certain uses. So what we have at the moment out there in Europe 
is a system of exceptions and limitations that is uh, basically closed. So either the exception is uh, provided by law or we cannot do anything to on the basis of the use. So we don't have a list of uses that are allowed, but a list of cases uh, for which we can use or not certain materials or certain data. So this is something that creates an obstacle because it means that either the legislator intervenes to add the new exception or we cannot do anything uh, to implement OA or OS policies or to pursue uh, the goals of realize a fair ecosystem unless the legislator uh, allows us to do it. So this closed system doesn't work and it doesn't work either the fact that courts tend to interpret those limitations and exceptions very strictly. So what is written in the law is written, doesn't matter what is the function of this exception. So it's kind of a box way of thinking. This means that the system doesn't work. It hinders the pursuance of uh, research, open research, open access and open science goals, uh, uh, if not written in the law, that's something that doesn't work. Same thing goes for the numerous clauses of uh, uh, exceptions and limitations at the EU level. That doesn't even give any possibility at the national level to push through certain policy options. Last but not least, uh, one thing is what is written in the law. The second problem we have is that all these provisions are uh, basically uh, uh, not mandatory. So this means that contract uh, license agreements between parties, parties can, can freely derogate from the law, which means that the license agreement between a research institution and the publisher may uh, scrap away exceptions and limitations that are provided by law. And this is something on which there is no provision at the EU level, and this is something on which there is no harmonization. So there is no legal certainty at the standardized level within the EU on what uh, contracts can or cannot do uh, compared to these exceptions and limitations. Uh, private autonomy is something that creates lack of legal certainty. Cross-border uses and cross-border uh, open practices cannot be really implemented if you don't have legal certainty in this respect uh, at the EU level. So next slide, very briefly, what we propose to tackle this uh, problem. First of all, to introduce the principle of open repository by design in copyright law, which means that laws, uh, copyright laws needs to make sort of uh, uh, mandatory that we, uh, that we as researcher can post our works, both if they are research data and if they are research publication and open repository. This is something that is called open access law. Some countries in the EU have it, but not all of them, which means legal fragmentation, no good. We need to have it on the EU level. That's point first. Second point, second publication right. Introduce it as a, as a rule at the EU level. Once again, to harmonize and have a common level playing field across the EU. What are second publication rights? Second publication rights are the possibility we, uh, an author has to retain the right to uh, use his own uh, uh, publication uh, also without losing the control over it because it's transmitted, is transferred to the publisher, to the first publisher. So retaining it is also another instrument by which having the possibility to implement open access policies in a gold and not green manner. Then, Introduce specific rules for uh, research uses, fair ecosystem, open access policies within EU copyright law. At the moment, we just have text and other mining exceptions. That's not fine. And uh, last, uh, actually, the two points are connected. Make these rules mandatory so that they cannot be derogated by contracts, so that the tilt in the bargaining power between researchers and publishers uh, uh, don't go in doesn't go in favor of publishers, but researchers can still be protected by mandatory rules in implementing OA and OS policies. And this should be done not just looking forward, so for new copyright reforms, but also looking backwards for exceptions that are already existing in EU copyright law. So we need to modify the entire setting, and this means that we need to update existing exceptions and limitations to implement those principles also backwards in order to create uniformity across the EU and legal certainty for all researchers to cooperate around the, the uh, EU uh, member states. That's all from my side. I think that now we can actually move to the Menti uh, uh, poll. This poll, which you see now here, uh, please uh, go on the uh, 
uh, on the website. We will start with the legal aspects. That was the part that uh, Electra was uh, uh, coordinating. I don't know if you, Electra, would like to uh, comment on the results that are popping up here. Mm, the first results, okay, so we have only two people right now, three people vote. Uh, the first results are that we see, oh no, we have a change here. So making open science policies integral part of national research framework and legislation is something that we see that it uh, has a lot of votes. And then um, the, the, the tools, um, the tools supporting fair no RDM are also following. And of course, legal expertise is needed. Yes, we all know that in all our research organizations. Um, but I, I see that, uh, that the first question has a prominent role over there. That we know that um, we need uh, some concrete legislation to work. Okay, so we have 16 people here. That's good. Uh, this could have, um, mm -hmm. you know, Electra, the, the, that, that in-house legal expertise is not um, favorite, is that, that would involve money, right? I mean, uh, directly. <laughs> you need budget good for point. that. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> good point, good point. So maybe uh, tools could help in this, uh, taking off this burden, <laughs> this, uh, this second burden of organization, like helping. And they think automating some uh, uh, some things. Yeah, it's interesting to see that the the gap between the preferences is, is much higher with this set of questions. So great. Mm -hmm. So I think we are coming to to a point that. Uh, that uh, steadily uh, legislation has the, the first role here and, uh, and uh, tools uh, addressing legal needs are in the second place, let's say. <laughs> so 20 people here, uh, should we wait for a few more seconds for any final yeah. votes? Great, great. Yeah, we can give people another couple of seconds if you want to get your votes yeah. in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so people please vote. I have to say that a couple oh. of seconds is fine. It's just that um, mm -hmm. in yeah. respect mm -hmm. of the time, but. Um, yeah. uh, I, I think, think uh, Eleni. Yeah, Eleni's got hand. her hand. Yeah, actually, I, I, want, uh, I would like to ask the people uh, who say that the in house legal expertise is needed. Uh, how do they have this in mind? Maybe someone who has voted for this, that we should address fair challenges by having in each organization a legal expert. Um, uh, how, how can this uh, take place? How, how do they have this in mind, the people who, support, uh, who say that we can support fair this way? Yeah, feel free to add things to the chat um, or raise your hand if you feel like unmuting and, and adding something in. We will have some time for some open discussion in just a couple of minutes. So I think maybe in the interest of time, we will move on to the next one. I think we've got a clear, mm -hmm. clear winner mm -hmm. for this poll. Yeah. So thanks very much. And hopefully we can move on to the next slide. If it moves, there we go. So intellectual property rights. Here we, here we are. So. <laughs> kind of a, of, a, of a difficult poll, I, I realize, because prioritize certain actions which are uh, uh, relatively interconnected with each other might be difficult, but please people vote and, uh, and tell us what should we start with? Well, I see that someone is giving strong priority to everything, basically. <laughs> This is one of the areas that is the most conflictual for researchers, in fact. 
every time we try to help researchers in dealing with open access and open science, the first thing they, they complain about is IP rights. They are also the most complicated in terms of uh, handling. I see that there is now a bit of tilt pre requiring more harmonization and more uniformity, more than the rest. And keeps them being uh, uh, the same. Yeah, now that the votes are coming in, in fact, we have still a preponderance of votes towards uh, uniformity in exceptions and limitations and the provision of uh, specific rules for uh, the scientific sector within copyright or generally IP uh, exceptions. I still see that there is a, a bit more skepticism about the fact that these rules need to be mandatory, uh, that it's something that is not perceived as important as having uh, a standardization. So it means that uh, there is still some trust in the fact that, that uh, private autonomy and contracting uh, is not something that damages so much the balance between uh, uh, exclusivity and access. So people vote, we still just have 14 votes and uh, the results are quite tight. Anyone else? In the meantime, can I ask Katerina, if, if you want to um, work on, these, on this harmonization, right? What time frames do are you thinking there? I mean, given the fact that probably all uh, member states are in favor of harmonization here in this respect, right? How, how long does do you expect this to have to take? Uh, this is a very good question, Jos, because one is also to be realistic. I, I had several talks with the copyright unit at the European Commission, particularly because we are also working parallel with, with other projects exactly on copyright exceptions and, and limitation. And this is something that uh, um, uh, pops up every time, simply because, um, for example, for text and data mining, uh, for more than a decade, uh, we asked uh, for uh, mandatory exceptions across the EU that could somehow uh, help us having clarity on what we can or cannot do with uh, database uh, uh, protected data. And it took uh, approximately five years to get from the first proposal to the moment in, in the first green papers and white papers of the commission to the moment when the, a directive introduced it. So now, realistically, we are asking for more and more mandatory exceptions. We are getting them, but the commission was quite clear in saying that during uh, the, the next five years, they will very much focus on implementing what's in there in the pipeline. And there won't be so many other policy uh, news uh, upcoming. Still, I believe that working on uh, on the side of open science and open uh, uh, access policies would help us pushing these aspects, not from within the copyright unit, but from outside. And this could, uh, for in, in other legal text, speed up this uh, this uh, uh, this policy all implementation. Going straightforwardly towards the direction of the copyright unit and copyright legislation might not be the best way forward. Okay, thank you. So there is another question in the in the chat um, um, that that you may want to answer, Katarina. And otherwise, I would just uh, urge everybody to close up this poll so we can go on to the next i think that the question which you which you see here it's mostly related to okay i see i'm just worried that this leads to a situation where big organization that can afford will be on the safe side regarding the uh, ipr for smaller ones that they will be in the gray zone i guess that this uh, is something that refers to the questions of whether or not we need to have an in-house expertise right I believe that uh, that's a function that would need to be integrated within the data protection officer role. So now we have the GDPR and the GDPR requires basically also universities to use a, a data protection officer. And uh, I believe that in terms of internal function, uh, 
also intellectual property, right? And in, in any case, the assistance that is needed on the side of open science will need to be internalizing that function. And I don't think that the legal expertise that is needed to be a DPO, uh, data protection officer, is so much different than the one you would need to deal with other type of exclusivity rights or absolute rights, like to, to use a, a, a proprietary terms like, like this one. It would have less of a cost impact if it would be done in that way. Otherwise, yes, it might require an investment that would penalize uh, smaller entities compared to big one. But that's, of course, it's my own take to see how universities and research centers will work, but I would be curious to hear the opinion of other member of this uh, panel, if any. Yeah, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop sharing my screen now and we can move on to the, the general discussion now. So I think we're, we're starting to get some good questions about this stuff. So um, I've stopped sharing and I think there were a few questions in the, the chat. And I think it was again going on to this disparity between, you know, the potential gap if we if we do have in-house legal expertise um, that it would give the benefit to those organizations that can afford it. So I don't know if you want to say a little bit of uh, on how we equal the playing field in that respect. How do we make sure that those organizations that can't afford an in-house legal expert, how do we make sure that they can get it? I, you mentioned the data protection officer could take on some of that role. I'm not sure that all data protection officers would feel confident to to step into that, you know, quite a minefield of a role. So I don't know if there's any other options that you might think of. I think got her hand raised as well. Yeah, go ahead, Katarina. Uh, Just to remind you, we have 15 minutes. So we have to speed up, please. I mean, just very, I believe that the legal uh, legal officers within universities uh, um, might be trained to do something like that. It's, uh, they, they have the basic legal skills to be trained. Of course, they don't study certain matters at universities. So uh, specialized courses would help them, but that would require that policies uh, are, are clear and the legal framework is clear. Uh, otherwise, uh, indeed, uh, is not cost effective, but the internalization of function uh, and uh, a clear requirement from uh, uh, the EU for universities and research centers to have certain competences would also justify and force on quote ministries to provide money for that function. So that would uh, create a bottom up push, exactly as it happened for the data protection officer. At the end of the day, now we finally have someone within universities helping with data management plan. Before we didn't have them. And that was because it was forced by law and now we need to invest money in that and countries need to figure out that they need to give a big a budget for that. So that could be an option somehow to, to move bottom up. But I am aware of the fact that it will require quite a lot of time to be implemented as it happened for the GDPR. Eleni has also our hand raised here. Yeah, because I, I, I raised this question. So the reason behind this is that it is true we have the data protection officers, uh, but it is also true that the smaller organizations still today do not have data protection officers. They outsource this activity. And this is something we see all the time. So considering that uh, uh, you can train people to become a data protection officer, this, this is doable within uh, a limited, uh, let's say, time. But uh, uh, I'm not sure that there will be many people who will be willing to, uh, to put their signature that legally everything uh, is correct and they have this responsibility within the organization. This is a big problem for smaller organizations, maybe not for universities, that's why uh, I believe that even legal experts do not have this combination of knowledge, knowing the open science policies, knowing the open science background, and knowing also all the aspects related to IPR and all other legal considerations. That's why also the suggestion we will, uh, it's not a suggestion, it's actually something I, I, I foresee it will happen in the next years. We will increase have technical tools that will help people, whether they are experts or laymans, 
to address these legal needs within organizations. Even legal experts will be in need of having legal tools, uh, having technical tools, as uh, things will become even more concrete and even more specialized. So there is no way that a person is in the position to know all these things. So yes, big organizations can afford this, smaller organizations cannot, but in any case, the technical solutions in the very near future will be for both, also for experts. Okay, thank you. Um... It just occurred to me that that most of these aspects that deal with legal uh, parts they need uh, it's not in in the hands of the researchers themselves, right? We're very much depending on outside um, expertise and probably additional money as well. Um, okay, um, with re looking at the time, um, as promised, there's another poll for you uh, where you can just uh, write down um, what you would like to see. In, in put into action in the in the new EOSC uh, in, in the future um, when it comes to policies. So here is your chance to uh, go to the Menti as Joy has already put up and um, state your wishes. Yeah, please, please feel free to add some recommendations. Uh, you've heard a little bit about what we've thought have been priorities for, for four areas. Um, we desperately would like to know what you think. Have we got the, the priorities right? Are there things that we're missing? Are there other things that you think we need to add? So please feel free to start adding in your chat here. So we've got to ensure researchers get recognition for the efforts and defining data standards that better fit their work. And, and uh, yeah, completely agree. I think that policies can make a lot of demands, but unless we actually start to recognize good behavior and you know controversially maybe start penalizing um, you know, consistent non-compliance, it's not going to take off. So we do definitely need to make sure we're putting extra effort into the recognition side of things as well as, as the policy. So that's a great point. Normalization of software workflow uh, protocol sharing for the purposes of reproducibility. Yeah, again, I think, you know, we, we focus a lot on DMPs covering uh, data. And I, I think, you know, another area that we looked at in most of the projects was, uh, do we need also to cover in, in policies things like software sharing and uh, code and, and all of that stuff. So I think we do need to kind of make sure that the policies are, are becoming a little bit more broad in their coverage. And it's not just publications and data sets, but it's covering a wider set of, of research output. So I think that's a great point as well. So I feel incentivizing open science practices amongst researchers would help drive fairness of open science overall. Uh, yeah, I completely agree. And I, I think, you know, we see things like the, the DORA principles, um, hoping to try and fill that gap. But, uh, you know, recent events in the UK, we've seen that um, when it comes to actually having any kind of leverage to enforce uh, organizations who have signed up to DORA to, to do the right thing, it can also be <laughs> quite difficult. So I think we, we definitely need to keep that on the, on the agenda. So reorient the DMP to a PMP. And I'm not, uh, maybe whoever has written that is, is that maybe Martin? I'm thinking because of the ARDC, is that PMP? Would you like to explain what you mean by a PMP? You feel free to un unmute if you, you'd like to explain it, but I, I'd like to maybe come back to that point if we have time. Um, not guilty as not Martin, you'd put the thing in about the Australians before. So if anybody <laughs> has, has uh, Project Man, it's, it's created a little bit of intrigue what this PMP is. So it's from Chris and he can't unmute, unfortunately. I don't know if we're able to give you. Uh, I can now. Thank oh, you. Excellent. So you go. Thanks. <laughs> yes, it was indeed a project management plan. Project and it, management. It, ah, it's okay. actually tied to what um, uh, someone else said about software workflows, um, you know, research outcomes, essentially. Uh, so, you know, the, the data, data management plan is kind of limiting. Um, yeah. And so, you know, taking a project um, based approach is, uh, is, I think, something we should maybe reorient too. Yeah, that's that's a great point. I think you know we've seen 
the attempts with uh, some funders like the Wellcome Trust in the UK to try and move to outputs management plans and things that are broader. But I think this, this project management plan is a nice example too. So thanks, thanks very much for sharing that. Uh, so I think we're getting a few others in here. Um, getting buy-in from senior senior leadership. Yeah, that's always tricky. And I think, you know, no matter what we're talking about with any of these priority uh, policy actions, they will require some investment, whether it's time or money from organizations. So we can't forget how important it is to try and, and make sure that um, the people who control the purse strings are, are willing to open them up to let us uh, support these policies and, and help people to adhere with them. Uh, so a couple of other points here, introduce open science requirements. Um, yeah, again, not just about sharing uh, data sharing or DMPs, but really pushing for that open research um, sort of uh, approach. And I think that's great. Yes, we want to see it as part of a, a bigger picture. I think DMPs uh, on their own can feel very bureaucratic. So making sure we're tying it to the, the higher level of objectives of open science is, is a good point. So push for harmonization and collaboration agreements, contracts, et cetera. One should not need legal experts. Um, I, I think that's a really good point. And I, I think there's a lot of tools that we use quite regularly when we're, we're putting together project proposals, collaboration agreements and, and contracts are certainly among them. And I think anybody who's got European Commission funding is, is used to looking at things like the model grant agreements. So yeah, I think there, there's you know potentially a way to, to start to harmonize some of these instruments to make sure that we don't necessarily need legal expertise to, to try and interpret them and to make sure that we can comply. So that's, that's a good point. Uh, provide free legal expertise. Um, that would be great. <laughs> I'm not sure who would pay for it at some point. Somebody, unless we get a, a, a pool of, of volunteer lawyers that we might be able to draw from. But yeah, I think providing free at the point of use legal expertise would be great. Um, I think using networks would be a good way to do that. Um, we see this very much within the kind of trying to set up data stewardship capacity within organizations. Um, very often they're moving towards a sort of a distributed peer network to do that. And I think legal aspects related to open science um, could certainly be something worth exploring as well. So that's that's really nice to see. Um, got a couple more. So we've got three minutes before the end of the session. So I'll just quickly look at these last two and then we'll, we'll hand back over to you, Joss, to, to wrap up. So we need clarity on when research needs to be open and especially fair and to what degree. I, I think that's a great point. Um, we still are working collectively to decide what fair means uh, and as, more importantly, what fair enough means in different disciplines. So that's a work in progress, but as these are defined in a sort of bottom-up approach among the communities, they do need to be kind of fed back into the policies so that we are a bit clearer on what we expect. Um, some of these comments can be very nebulous and, and can be interpreted in a number of different ways. So we wanna be clear on what we mean in the policies, especially with these, uh, these terms. So that's a great point. And we need efforts to establish, uh, to establish research policies uh, integrated in all the EU DGs, uh, overcome nat national and ministry boundaries. Yeah, I, I think so much of research is uh, not just international in a European context where we're encouraged to work uh, across borders, but increasingly is global. So we're not just even navigating uh, European uh, legislations and, and uh, policy landscapes, we're also now having to, to work in a much more global context. So I think uh, that's a really great point as well. So thank you very much for everybody who's contributed. Um, we'll there's leave one more the poll open in. for, oh, there's one, okay. Modular policies and guidelines. Yeah, I, I think that's great. We're never gonna get the policies completely right on the first go. So we do need to kind of make sure we're able to, to refine them and join them up in the, the bigger ecosystem. So I think that's great. So we'll, we'll leave the poll open. Um, and if you do have any other ideas that you would like to add, please feel free. Um, and we will try to write this up and we will share the, the results of the mentee polls with everybody after the events when we share the links to the slides. So I'll, I'll just hand over to you, Yas, now and, and you can- uh, yes. Thank you. As, as you said, we will, we will uh, copy uh, the, 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 question, the, the, the remarks and, and uh, the information and the slides uh, to you, back to you. And um, um, 
just for me to thank all presenters, all people that helped in the background getting these things ready. And of course, on Veronica for leading us to technically through the session. Um, and the audience, of course, for helping us out here and um, bringing forward your ideas and, and, and opinions. Thank you all and closing up now. Yes, thank bye you bye. very much for joining. Uh, we'll update uh, the recordings and the presentation, so stay tuned.